Hi, it's Rich Gravani here. Welcome back. If you've ever dreamed of making your own film, then this is the show you've been waiting for. Our guest today is Kevin J. Lindenmuth of Brimstone Productions for some insights into the world of independent filmmaking. So come on in. It's front row. So why did you decide to become a film major? Is this more of your character analysis? No. I mean, is it because you love movies? Or do you want to change the world? I don't mean to be rude, but Sarah, that's got to be like the dumbest question I've ever heard. Kevin, amongst many other things, is the author of this book, Making Movies on Your Own practical talk from independent filmmakers. Anybody who's thinking of making a movie can save a lot of money getting this book. And it's available from McFarland Press. So, uh, I, I always like to start off by asking about what got you where you are today, mm -hmm. I mean, your childhood. What, what were the influences? I think a big part of it was watching a lot of these things on TV, you know, when I was a kid. Um, you know, like the Saturday morning horror shows. And uh, I remember, you know, when I was three, four, or five years old, watching these things, like the old Universal stuff and, and stuff like Frankenstein meets the Space Monster and like all these type of things. And also Dark Shadows, because Dark Shadows was on. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember sitting down, you know, watching it. And this was before I was even in kindergarten. And uh, just really being, you know, glued to the set, you know. Mm. I think that's why I like vampires so much, is, you know, the whole Barnabas thing. And oh, yeah. Dark okay. Shadows, so. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, just watching that type of stuff. And then I had relatives who took me to, you know, see a lot of horror movies and, and that type of thing. Even, uh, you know, recently when I was a teenager, I couldn't get in to see the Friday the 13th movies. And um, my grandmother loved those movies. So I would always like go to see these, you know, these really gory slasher movies and stuff with my grandmother because, you know, she, she liked them. You know, so <laughs> you so were it was a hilarious. Lucky kid. Yeah. So, you know, I got to see like all this stuff. I mean, so yeah. it was good. Yeah. So I just seen, you know, tons of horror movies mm -hmm. and, and all that type my of stuff. My parents thought I was a sick child for liking oh, this right. stuff. So you're in a more enlightened day. Yeah, my parents just kind of let me alone and they knew I liked this stuff and they just, you know, said, oh, you know. Well, so it worked out. <laughs> yeah, it really did work out. You're yeah. making films, and mm -hmm. that's the difference. Yeah. Uh, did you start out basically as a writer? I mean, how did you start out when, when you started making your own films? Um, well, yeah, I was a writer before because, you know, I was always writing. You know, again, as a kid, I would always write short stories and all that type of thing. And then um, as I got into, like, junior high and high school, I would do a lot of short stories, a lot of, you know, horror stuff and science fiction stuff and send it out. And... It was all published in small press, you know, magazines mm -hmm. and stuff. So I was actually getting stuff published. You know, really wasn't getting paid, but I was starting to get stuff published in high school. And then I continued to do that in college. And I was always writing scripts and all that type of stuff. So I think, you know, that kind of led into the filmmaking. I always wanted to, to make films. Um, and I always had these ideas and stuff that I was writing down. So, I mean, I think it just kind of like, you know, fell into it. Two important elements. You, know, you want to make the films, and you have the ideas for the films. Yeah. You're saving a lot of uh, time and trouble there. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I read that you had said was that, and I, I got a kick out of this, you said that one of the most important things you can do for your actors, particularly if they're not getting paid, is to feed them well. Yeah. I mean, you... you yeah, that's really important because, um, you know, when you're doing these low-budget films, you know, you usually can't pay your actors. You tell them that, and they understand that, you know, they know what it is, and you know, they're just kind of doing it for the practice or they want it for the real or they just want to act in something because they're actors and they, they like to act, you know. So, you know, they understand this. But when you're shooting, you know, you have to make things very comfortable for them, you know. You know, there can't be any attitude, there can't be any yelling at your actors or doing anything like that. And you got to treat them well. You got to treat them like humans, you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, as long as people are fed well, you know, they're very content. <laughs> so, you know, you always have like bowls of chips around, lots of soda. Um, 
you know, it just makes the atmosphere more relaxed and it makes your actors happier, you mm. know. And, and when you order food, you know, it isn't necessarily just pizza all the time. You could, you know, go to a restaurant or something. I mean, it should be, anytime I do a film, um, I think the food itself is like half the budget, you know. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> because it's important, you know. Yeah, they also feel they're saving money. I know yeah. that for, you know, they're not paying for meals. Yeah, but you got to include that. That has to be most of your budget is, mm. is the food because I know people who've shot stuff um, and didn't feed their actors or just said, oh, go out, get your food yourself. And you just hear bad things about those shoots. You know, and the <laughs> actors complain about the directors. And, you know, you just hear, you know, they don't say, oh, the movie was shit or anything. They're like, oh, he didn't feed me. You know, it was bad. So I didn't even want to get into that, you yeah, know. Yeah. Um, so, so every movie I've done, I just made sure that that food was important. <laughs> <laughs> you hear that first time, filmmakers? Yeah. You know, take, take yeah. note. Yeah, uh, that definitely helps. Now, your first film was it Vampires and Other Stereotypes? Yeah, Vampires the first and Other one? Stereotypes, yeah. Also known as Hell's Bells? Yeah. Um, I had released it, I think, in 94 myself, and I you know, sold some copies and all that. And then uh, years later, this company EI Cinema, yeah. they, they liked it and they wanted to re-release it. And at that point, I was figuring, you know, what the hell, why not? You know, uh -huh. could use some bucks. Um, so they just retitled it Hell's Bells, which I never uh -huh. really liked the title. It was kind of yeah, it's, whatever. It's, it's, it didn't really have anything to do with the movie, really, other than that there's three or four, you know, actresses in it. Yeah. And, and, and so they were in hell, so yeah. I guess, you know. So they released it under that, and they sold some copies, and so yeah. that's how that came about. So yeah. when I get the rights back, I think the rights expire in another, like, couple months. I'll change it back to vampires and other stereotypes. And you were writer, producer, and director on that? Yeah, writer, producer, director, director. No. everything. Here's a key question. Uh-huh. Uh, the publicity says you shot it for thirty thousand mm. dollars. Now, is that everything? What did that cover? That thirty thousand covered everything because um, it was so expensive because I had like rent a car out. I was shooting out in a studio in New Jersey, which was like ninety miles. It's right outside Philadelphia, so it was a good like ninety, ninety-five miles away because I had access to this big, huge garage where I could build sets and everything. And um, just shipping the actors out there, I had to put them in a hotel. You know, um, mm -hmm. I didn't have editing facilities myself. I had to actually pay for all the editing. Mm -hmm. uh, I put it through that film book process, and mm -hmm. then added. I mean, so all together, I mean, it was a huge expense. I mean, all those things since I could take care of myself, so my movies aren't quite that expensive. Right. So it was a big learning experience. Yeah. But it was expensive because there were so many people. I mean, you know, basically the more people you have, the more expensive your movie is going to be because you got to feed them all and deal right. with them, and it kind of slows things down. And at times, I swear, I had 30 people working on that movie. Yeah, really? You know, and then by the time it wound down, I think there was five of us. So, you know, <laughs> so at the beginning of it, the first week, there was like all these people, and then people kind of went away and and all that stuff. So. Do, you t do you try to shoot and limit your location so that so that you don't have a lot of moving around to do, or is that not a concern? Um, it is a concern with some movies because it makes it easier. You know, like vampires and other stereotypes was all shot in the same place, and that really helped. Yeah. Um, and then some of the other movies were shot mostly in the same apartments and stuff, just, you know, turning the camera around. You have a different location, mm -hmm. <laughs> a different right, apartment. You know, right, it's supposed right. to be five different apartments. It's really one, mm -hmm. uh, that type of thing. So um, it definitely saves on time and setup and all that and with coordinating the actors because once they're there, you know, you have them. They're not going to show up at all different places. But, um, but this one recent movie I did, um, what is it? It's... Uh, you got it here? Rage of the Werewolf. Rage of the Werewolf. Um, that was shot all over the place. Um, I mean, that was shot over a period of several months on weekends and sometimes during the days and stuff. Yeah. And uh, the thing with that is we had to make New York look like it was abandoned. Um, you know, so we were shooting, like, behind buildings, and we are shooting, like, out. And we went out to Coney Island one morning, like, at 6 in the morning, which, like, I don't recommend you do because <laughs> <laughs> you just see a lot of weird things. Yeah. Um, so we shot out there, and it really made New York look very desolate. You know? Yeah, it did. It was effective. So, it's, but the bad thing about that is because uh, the city is so noisy, we had to redub everything. We had to like you know put all the voices in afterwards, and that was kind of a hassle. But that was shot all over the place, and that is, you know took a lot more time. Mm -hmm. um, and a film called Walking Between the Raindrops. Now this is not, this was you produced. That was a drama. Yeah, I, yeah. Uh, I produced it and directed it, and it was written by a guy named Evan Jacobs, um, who lives out in California. And uh, with that, I wanted to do a drama. I mean, I just wanted to do something different than a horror movie because everybody, you know, would say, oh, all you do is horror movies. But, you know, I also watch other movies. I just don't watch, <laughs> you know, horror yeah. and science fiction. I watch other things. And it was kind of always an interest to do, like, just a straight, you know, movie, you know, with characters and stuff. Because mm -hmm. um, basically that's kind of how I view my other movies, like the vampire movies. You know, if you took out that element, 
they would still make sense, you know, mm -hmm. because they would interact the same pretty much. They're just kind of weird people. Right. So with the drama, um, I came across a script that Evan had did, and uh, I really liked it a lot. So, um, you know, we decided, me and my wife did it. She did all the sound, and she helped with the editing. And we went out to California for like eight days and shot it out there. I was on my cul-de-sac playing with the kids on my street one day. I was a lot younger. And um, I went in to go to the bathroom, and while I was in there, my parents were like, we need to tell you something. And they were really serious. And they like sat me down at the kitchen table, and I totally remember where I sat. Like I hated that. When I, I was sat younger, here. and they would sit, and I had to tell me some. Oh man, no, I'm sorry, let me interrupt. But it's like because we see so many movies when we're younger, like Eight Is Enough and stuff like that, and like different strokes and all those shows. Those and we, shows, and you start and sat thinking, down. Yeah, and something's wrong when yeah. you're sat down. Yeah, like, whenever it's you're huge. sat down, you always assume that there's something wrong. Okay. Totally, okay. that's what I was thinking. I was all freaked out. So I sat down at the table, and my parents are right here, and my mom goes, she says. Your birthday isn't really November 8th. What? It's January 8th. And I was like, what? Yeah, see, that's what I thought. I thought that's what you... My real birthday is January 8th, but uh -huh. my parents, when I was really young, thought that I was ready to go in, into um, kindergarten early, uh -huh. and my birthday didn't make the cutoff date. So they faked a birth certificate Are you serious? for me and put on it that my birthday was November 8th, and my whole life I celebrated November 8th until I was, like, in high school when you have to have, like, real documentation. Wait, so, you were... so you're 15... You've been 15 years of your life thinking that I'm you're... not 15. No. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but I, I'd be in trouble here. But no, I'm saying no, but I'm saying... So it was like the easiest shoot I ever did because there were no effects. Mm -hmm. um, everybody was kind of out there already. All the actors were out there. And it was just basically, you know, the cost was flying out there, uh, shooting. We shot it all with a DV camera and uh, just feeding the actors and stuff, you know. Mm. So. When, when was that? Was it the mid-90s? That was done two years ago. Oh. And we... Uh, the thing was edited on Betacam, and then we, we actually transferred that to 16 millimeter film because we wanted to enter it into the film festivals and stuff. We got into a couple film festivals and it was shown, and mm -hmm. we're still shopping it around. We thought it would be easier, actually, to sell a drama than a horror film, but it's actually easier to sell the horror stuff. So. Well, my next question was, was it, how did it, how did, what was the effect of uh, transferring it to 16? Did it, it looked look, really good. It looks like 16, Did it look like yeah. it was shot on 16? Yeah, it fooled a lot of people because um, one time I was making some copies of it at this duplication facility. And I had the, the 16 millimeter print transferred to Betacam. And so I'm just, you know, transferring it. It's on the monitor. Mm -hmm. And some film guys walk in and, you know, who shoot 16 and 35. And they're looking at it. And they're like, well, what's this? And I'm like, oh, it's a film I did. And they're looking at it for like, you know, a couple minutes, just looking at it. Like, oh, you shot that in 16. Huh? Looks really good. Mm -hmm. So that was my tell, you know, that show yeah. that it was convincing. So it was shot on tape. Transferred to 16 and then tra shown tra on tape, tra right? Transferred tra to, tape to tape and shown yeah. on a big screen, but, it still looked yeah. like film. Yeah, but it actually looks better just projected because I have, you know, a couple 16 millimeter prints of it. And oh. It's interesting seeing yeah. it that way. Now, the Alien Agenda series, you've done so much yeah. that, uh, that uh, half hour isn't much time to cover it all. Yeah. So we're picking out cer certain... Uh, yeah certain elements of your work. The Alien Agenda series, uh, uh, according to this, you wrote, directed, photographed, produced, and edited? Yeah, segments of them. Those were, um, that was a project where I got other filmmakers involved. Right. And they did segments. Um, I kind of came up with this whole scenario about two different types of aliens trying to take over the Earth for very different reasons. And then kind of people are caught in the middle. So, you know, with that backdrop, I had them write stories and come up with ideas and stuff. Oh, I so I did like the wraparound stories. And then, you know, I had these people across the country um, do other segments that kind of fit in with the wraparound story. So, oh, okay. so it was much easier to do it that way. And the people I got involved with were other filmmakers that, you know, I got along with. Um, mm -hmm. Mostly who I met through doing interviews for the book. When I was writing my book, I got to know a lot of filmmakers and be in touch with them and all that. Because I did these interviews and talked to them on the phone sure. and emailed and all that stuff. Yeah. So I kind of figured out who would be good for the project, you know. We're all kind of similar mindset, you know. Not a lot of conflict, you know, yeah. and, uh, and did it that way. And they came together pretty good. We did like three of them. I think it took two years to do three. Yeah. But where do you get, I mean, how, is it to, how easy is it to come up with all of these ideas, basically? How do you, do you get them in your sleep? Oh, come you, up, yeah. What the ideas I, have, I have far more many ideas than, than uh, I could can... ever do, you know. They just come, you know, mm -hmm. from dreams or just from weird things in life. <laughs> that happen, you know. I mean, there's definitely some things in the movies that are very autobiographical, you know, in terms of just like people I know that are in the mood, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You kind of base the character's personality on people that you know right. or knew or whatever, and, and, and basically only I know this, you know, yeah. so when I watch them, you know, they're very, uh, 
yeah. me. Yeah, well, I think right, a lot of writers yeah. have to use things from their own experience because yeah. that's what makes it unique. Yeah. And they kind of, you know, and as a writer thing, you know, these characters kind of write themselves. You come up with the character first, and you plug them into the scenario, and then all that dialogue just kind of flows. Right. So, in terms of writing, it's uh, pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. But, oh. uh, but, it, but in terms of what the alien agenda, I'm actually doing a whole other series called The Alien Conspiracy. That's, that's what you're working on yeah, now, right? Yeah, and it's yeah. a follow-up. And uh, I have a bunch of filmmakers involved with that, like Tim Ritter, who lives in Kentucky. I got Ron Ford, who lives out in California. Um, this guy, Les Sakelli, who li lives out in California. And I'm doing the wraparound stories, which are all in New York City. And these guys are shooting stuff other parts of the country, so it really ups the production value of the movie. Because, you know, mm -hmm. these movies, I think, have a budget of like, you know, six, seven thousand dollars altogether. Yeah. But they should look more expensive because, you know, all, this, all across the country, different locations, right. all that type of stuff. And um, when, when you did shoot on film, mm -hmm. I think I, I asked you this before, before we uh, started, but it, uh, I had heard that if you're going to shoot on film, um, that believe, no, I didn't ask you this, but I had heard that. That 35 millimeter is actually not that much more expensive to do if you're going to do if you're going to shoot 16. I know. Is that true? I think it is in terms of just the film cost, just you know the processing and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and renting the equipment, getting the equipment costs from nothing compared to video. Like if you had to rent beta cam package and stuff. I mean, film equipment is really cheap, mm -hmm. and the lighting, whatever, you know, it's the same. Um, but yeah, I think the big cost with the film is getting it processed. Yeah. You know, and plus you don't want to do as many takes. I mean, with video. You do it till you get it right. You know, mm -hmm. tape is cheap, is mm -hmm. what they say. You know, yeah. cause it costs nothing. You can shoot hours and hours. It doesn't cost that much. But when you're shooting film, you know, you have the two, three takes at most. Well, what's your, what would you say your ratio is on tape? The ratio on tape is probably five to one. You know, I shoot five times more That's, than what I need. Yeah. And, that and, works usually, and usually the last one is the one that I use. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I've always heard that it's, it's the first one. No, it's usually the last one because by that time they're warming up in the scene and they, uh, mm -hmm. they get it finally at the end. I kind of... Yeah. I see them acting, and I see them how they're doing the scene. You kind of tweak their performances, like you know, do it a little bit lower, or just right. do it a little bit more hyper. And by the last scene, I'm like, I got it, and I stop and I go on to the next one. Uh -huh. So it's always almost when I'm editing, I always almost always go to the last scene. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, automatically, right? And yeah. If pretty you don't much. like it, you look at the others. Yeah. And then right. I do coverage of close-ups and stuff. All right. Yeah. I shoot, I shoot, you know, to edit because I also edit them, right. so I know what I need. You know when I'm shooting, yeah. so it's pretty fast. I mean, I, actors are always amazed. I'll tell them that um, you know we'll be done at seven o'clock, and they're going, yeah, yeah, right. And we're done at six thirty, and they're like, I can't believe we're done. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, yeah, you know, we're done shooting. We got everything done for that day. I guess you've just got more efficient over the years. Huh? Yeah, really efficient, and I kind of know what I need. I don't have to relay it to everybody else. Like, you know, this is what I want because I'm doing you know ninety percent of the, you know, I'm shooting it, I'm right. directing it, I'm probably lighting it, you mm -hmm. know. So everything is kind of how I want it. Mm. So it definitely <laughs> saves time. Yeah. So it would have been nice if you could have uh, could have been doing this at the time Orson Welles was alive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I always feel like that guy who's you know playing the accordion and the, the drum, you know, like the one man band yeah, type right, of thing. Yeah, right, right, right. So. Spinning the dishes and exactly. keeping them all up and everything. Exactly. Um, what is a doorway dolly? A uh, doorway dolly. This is like just a, from a. It's a dolly, but it's a dolly that's not on the tracks. It's just like a, yeah. It's really heavy. You know, it has the you just kind of pull it around. Yeah. You know, it's a dolly that kind of folds up and stuff. But oh. It's a dolly. I thought it's like a trackless dolly. Oh, okay. I heard the, heard the term and I knew you yeah. used one, but I didn't know what it was. Have you ever Have you ever used a uh, um, a crane? Have you no. ever done that far? That's real expensive. I know. But you've, have you yeah, and, but I know people have made them like really cheap and have used them on stuff, but I've never really used. Uh, all right. Working with these very set low budgets. Oh, know? sure. No, I, I just wondered if you basically ever had. for food. But uh, yeah. <laughs> all right. What, in your opinion, is your best film and why? The best film? Or the, what do you think is your best work? It's probably the first two Addicted to Murder movies, you know, because um, they turned out like 95% how I wanted them to turn out, you know, because you kind of have this vision in your mind when you're writing a script and everything, you know, you kind of visualize, I'm a very visual person. Mm. So when I'm writing something, you know, I see it, like as in a movie. Um, so the key is when I'm doing a script and transferring it, you know, making the movie, I'm trying to match that image in my mind with what I'm actually doing, you know. And uh, those two turned out really well, and they're both very different movies. I mean, the first Addicted to Murder is just, like, I wanted a disturbing, moody movie, you know. It's just very kind of grim and, and uh, almost kind of painful to watch. And then with the sequel, which actually is like a prequel, um, I didn't want it to be serious. It was very sarcastic and very... Um, 
dark humor, and mm -hmm. I find it really hilarious. I really find it a funny movie. Mm -hmm. And I take some of the characters that were in the first movie and kind of show a different perspective of them. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, using the same characters from both movies, but having a different mood in both movies, I think was interesting. So mm -hmm. I think it's a tie between those two. Do do the, do most of them turn out uh, come out at least eighty percent of what you were visualizing? Yeah, they all do. Yeah, they all do. Yeah. But I think that's because they're low budget, and so I'm writing, you know, for certain locations that I know I have. I'm sometimes writing for actors that I know I'm going to cast in the part who will do it. Right. So it's all tailored to what I have access to, rather than just writing this huge epic and trying to do it. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, you would also said you. I think I guess it was one film you did. You threw out the storyboards. Oh, vampires and other vampires stereotypes. stereotypes. Yeah. I, I'm always fascinated with the uh -huh. idea of storyboards because I don't need to interrupt you, but uh, they seem like a good idea. Well, I don't understand how you can make a film without it because it's like, oh, I needed that connecting shot or that over-the-shoulder thing. We didn't get it. Or how do you do it without in your all in your head without a storyboard? Yeah. Well, with vampires and other stereotypes, I storyboarded the whole thing, you know. And uh, after like I swear the third day, I was just like <laughs> throughout because it, it was just too difficult. It was just too difficult to convey you know, to show them the storyboards, and this is what I want, because I had a bunch of different lighting guys and my director of photography yeah. had a communication problem, and uh, which was interesting. And uh, <laughs> because basically he, he was Italian, and, uh, you know, he spoke English pretty good, but he couldn't really read it. So I find out that, you know, <laughs> the third day into, into the shoot that he never read the script, and, and he kept on asking me, well, what's going on in here? What's going on? He never really understood it. And I realized it's because he never read the script. <laughs> and so, you know, that posed a little bit of problem. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that was pretty funny. So um, I just had to basically tell them what I wanted and show them rather than, and I had to change things around so much to how I wanted um, that storyboards were of no use. And then when I did subsequent movies, um, because I am shooting it usually myself, um, I know how it's going to edit together, and I know what shots I need, mm -hmm. so I don't need to write it down because mm -hmm. nobody else needs to look at it, you know. Yeah, yeah. But so, so I know in my mind, like, you know, at this point in the scene, I'm going to go from the wide shot to the close up. I'm going to stay in the close up to the end of the shot. So, okay. you know, I just know this. Like, I know what I need. Even little incidental shots of a close up of something or something yeah, like that you I don't forget. No, I know it all. I, I, I know exactly what I need to shoot for the shot. I never, when I'm editing, I never come across like, oh dang, I should have had that shot, you know, I needed this. I, I didn't get the coverage, I always get all the coverage I need. Because coverage is like the number one thing when you're shooting a movie, yeah. you just gotta make sure you have all the coverage yeah. that you need to, to edit the shot together. It's amazing to me, but I guess that comes with experience and in, in doing. Yeah. Um, I, I have a, yeah, I have a kind of a, I have it down. Yeah. <laughs> After doing like 12 of these things, I kind of know, you know, right. how to knock them out. When the film is done, and uh, you, it's time to distribute it. Mm -hmm. All right, now I, I don't know too many people who handle all of that themselves, the business end of it too. You've got, uh -huh. God knows you've got enough to do, uh -huh. but uh, isn't that awful tangled? To, to, I mean, is it a lot of work to, uh, to basically handle the distribution end and everything? It's a lot of work figuring it out, because um, the way I do it is, um, see, I don't trust distributors. <laughs> you know, people who are like, you know, that's their job, they're a distributor, you know. I'm not gonna name any distributors, but, you know, I've got reamed a couple times by people who just didn't pay me. Um, and, uh, you know, distributor, video distributor is synonymous with, like, demons spawned from hell. From, you know, <laughs> they're, uh, they're, like, they're evil. You know, they're evil. Avoid them. You know, they're, like, they, they will just take advantage of you. You know, you don't ever give them your master. You don't ever sign anything with them. So what I do, uh, for at least domestic, for, you know, United States, I distribute myself, and that means that I get the boxes made, I design the boxes, and have somebody, you know, they do that for me, and I get them printed up, I make the copies of the tape, and then I sell physical copies of the tape to distributors, you know, who mark up the price and sell it to their contacts. So, I mean, I, I deal with distributors, but they're paying for these tapes, like, you know, COD, mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, you do it that way. Yeah. You know, you don't, you don't give, you aren't, they're not responsible for making the copies and stuff because you know, you're, you're supplying them the tape, so you know exactly where every tape goes. Very smart. You know? So that's yeah. the way to do it. But it's an expense because, you know, you got to spend another thousand dollars getting the boxes made. Mm -hmm. You have to make the copies, which are a couple bucks a tape. Mm -hmm. You got to ship them, right. you know. But once you have that down, you know, you sell to enough people, it's kind of worth it. I and just, nowadays, there's places like on the internet, like Amazon. You yeah. could sell your tapes on Amazon. I mean, yeah. I do pretty good on that every year. Um, eBay is a great place. Oh, I mean, yeah. Between Amazon and eBay. Good old know, eBay. Yeah. Um, 
It never works putting an ad in a magazine for yeah. mail order. Never works. Never made any money. Well, I wonder where that is. I don't know. Yeah. I guess people are more people are more apt to buy a magazine for seven bucks than to buy a video for ten dollars for mm. some reason. I don't know why mm. that is, but also it's you probably just don't reach as many people. I mean, eBay reaches the world. Right? Yeah, but you still you reach thousands of people. I've yeah. even placed ads in you know Fangoria magazine, which mm. has a readership of like you know a quarter of a million people. Oh, is that large? Yeah. Wow. And no orders, you know, so it's mm. not worth it doing yeah. it that way. So yeah, so you know, getting into the sub distributors who buy tapes, they get it out there through the video stores, and like Blockbuster bought five of my movies and did that. Oh, and I did that myself. And then foreign distribution, you know, they'll buy it yeah. uh, for X amount of dollars, you know, for a certain amount of time. And so you just deal with them once. They give you the money. You give them the tape. You don't worry about it. They could sell, you know, thousands of copies, but you, know, you already got your money. Mm -hmm. so, I, have, I have a riddle for you. Uh -huh. How can you tell if a distributor is lying to you? If their lips are moving. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I read your thing. Sorry. <laughs> oh, oh, I thought that was your. I thought that was your. Uh, I thought that started with you. Oh, maybe it was. Okay, uh, starting out, brand new filmmaker, somebody who has talent. Uh -huh. What would be, what would be their first rule of thumb is something to do, something positive that they should do. In when words, making their film. Yeah, something, something. Well, they should stick with it. Be very persistent because people will try talking you out of it, especially if it's a low budget movie. People don't really treat it as a real movie. Mm -hmm. Um, so ignore all this negative stuff you get about it. I mean, just got to be persistent. You got to finish it, and then plan on having to sell it yourself. A lot of these people who make movies think that, gee, they're going to sell it and make a lot of money and stuff. They're going to sell it to like Troma. Mm. They're going to sell it to, you know, and they'll get their two thousand dollars for the movie, but the movie costs them ten thousand. You mm -hmm. know, um, don't be desperate enough just to get your movie out there and give it away. I mean, you know, only spend a couple thousand dollars if it's a shot on video movie. Um, you know, three thousand dollars most and then try selling it yourself. And it mm -hmm. may take years to get that money back, or you might get it back in a year, but they should be prepared to do the whole gamut, you know? Mm -hmm. Because, and also distributors don't really want to take the shot on video stuff for some reason. Mm -hmm. They're all, all these distributors who are, you know, demons spawned from hell, yeah. are also film critics, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. And to them, it's just a business, you know? Mm -hmm. They, uh, you know, they, they view your movie as product. They refer to it as product, yeah. you know? And a lot of times they don't even watch your movie. You find out that, you know, they've been, buying it or whatever, they have no idea what the movie's about. Well, Kevin so. Lindenmuth, continued success. You're moving to Michigan soon, right? Oh, so yeah. we're glad we caught you before yeah. you move. A little less stress. Yeah, and I Make don't forget movies. Don't forget the book, Making yeah. Movies on Your Own by Kevin J. Lindenmuth. It's been a real pleasure and I think an enlightening half hour and I hope for everybody. Kevin, thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks. We'll see you next time on Front Row. I hope you were all taking notes out there because if you did, you're ready to make your own independent film. Well, it's actually not that simple, but you get the idea. You can see a little bit of the ins and outs of independent filmmaking. We hope you enjoyed the show, and we hope to see you next time on Front Row. Like, I can't believe we're done. I'm like, yeah, you know, we're done.